Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Adventures of a Real Estate Investor. I'm Susie. And I'm Michael, and we're excited you joined us for this adventure. So today's very special guest is Todd Silence. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Yeah, and we are excited for you to be here, and we're excited for you to give all of your wisdom to our listeners, just to let everyone know out there, like, we had a call with Todd a couple of weeks ago, and there was just like some great energy. We really enjoyed the call. And so we were super excited when he was like, hey, I want to be on the podcast. We're like, yes, winning. Yes, oh, it's perfect. So thank you again. Yeah, no, this is great. This is great. You're talking me up here a little bit. I'm just, you know, hopefully I, I can perform to your standards. <laughs> Todd, I have no doubt you're going to deliver. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, thanks again. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, with, without further ado... Todd, would you mind sharing with our adventurous family a little bit more about your background and how you started getting investing in real estate? Yeah, absolutely. You guys mentioned we connected a couple of weeks ago, You know, found you through your podcast, really loved what you were doing and kind of your investments and, and wanted to reach out because a little of my background is some of that outdoor adventure there, but I've been investing in real estate for about five years now, but my prior experience and everything I have known prior to that has been the corporate world. Like a lot of your listeners listening to your show there have a background. I came out of school working in the insurance field and did that for about 16 years. Throughout that period of time, my wife and I started a business. We bought an Anytime Fitness franchise. And that was kind of going to be our initial platform to move out of the corporate world is owning our own business. And that's what led us into buy, buying a franchise. And it was great. It allowed my wife to, to move out of her profession. And when we started a family, really provide that time that we wanted with our family. But for me, I stayed in the corporate world. I continued to work a corporate W-2 job. For, for about 15 plus years there until it became, as we started to grow our family, it was time for me to move on. And I needed to look for that other opportunity and look for what can provide some additional passive income, give me flexibility, give me freedom to be with my family. And that's where I really found real estate you know, through other, other business owners. And even when I was working in the insurance world, a lot of the people I was around were investing in real estate. And then that kind of said, hey, that's where I want to go. And that's where the opportunity was and I, st I started back in 2018, but I started small. You know, I started single family homes and it kind of just snowballed from there to hey, we're going to get a four unit, then a 10 unit, et cetera. Where now I'm a partner in a company, Summit Capital, where we provide investment opportunities for passive investors, just like you guys do for larger apartment buildings where we can we can syndicate that. And that's where I'm at today. And again, looking to just share my knowledge and help other investors out. That's awesome. I appreciate that information and and sharing your your story. What I want to dive into, I'm sure a lot of our adventures family like like to you know go off the beaten path every now and then. But that being said, I'd like to know how it is being a franchise owner. Like just we could just take a quick sidebar yeah. and go back into real estate. But I think it's I think it's important because I think there's lots of business dynamics there that might have relations to real That's estate. That's what I was gonna say. You could say like what's very similar and what's like completely different too. Oh, oh, definitely. We could talk days. Like I love talking just business in general, even, you know, how it relates to real, to real estate and, you know, franchise for, for me and ownership, you're right, Susie, it does translate into the real estate or own your own real estate company like you guys have. Because one of the reasons why we bought a franchise, you know, we were back in our early 20s. And at that time, we were probably naive, didn't really understand everything about business. But what drew us to, to owning a franchise was the systems in place that, you know, when you buy a franchise, right, you're buying a proven concept with systems in place. And all we needed to do then is implement inside the gym or inside that club, our own culture, our own systems of operating. But it's kind of like a turnkey real estate investment. Hey, they're going to provide you all the material. They're going to provide you, the, you know, the the business in a box in a sense. Now, for some people, that's not they don't want that, right? You, you they don't want to be put in a box in that sense. I want to open my own my own business. But for us, just who we were and how analytical we were, that to me seemed like that's going to be have a higher rate of success with a franchise than me just opening my own gym. And that's kind of again why we went that route. Plus, it was going to be our opportunity 
opportunity when we looked long term and what we wanted to do from starting a family and where we wanted to be. We wanted to ultimately get out of that W-2 world. And at the time, as I mentioned, real estate wasn't even in my head. Like I didn't even know anything about real estate. It was, hey, why don't we open a business? And that's the business opportunity. And that's kind of, or I should say, where we decided to go from a franchise. Now, Michael, to your asking about like, how does it relate to real estate? That experience of owning one since 2008, it was when we opened our first location for the last 15, yeah, we've been in it for 15 years. So it wasn't like, hey, it was just five years ago. It was literally, you know, we've been doing our first franchise in 2008. You know, that experience of operating a business and then another location and having employees, but putting implementing systems translated when I got into real estate, when I just started investing for myself, like, hey, you know, I'm going to buy a single family home. Well, what system should I have in place to manage it, you know, to purchase it, to underwrite it? And then as I got that experience in the real estate world, as we got larger and larger properties, you know, having that background and, and, and operating another business, it just kind of, as we grew, I was able to build it out and say, well, I'm going to build out the, the real estate side, just like, the, like a, if it was a franchise, you know, what can we automate? What kind of systems can I have in place? And that's kind of what we did for on, on with the real estate business. That's cool. I mean, yeah, I guess I have thought about franchise, buying a franchise and like, and then you mentioning, you know, you're buying it like a turnkey, it's like a turnkey property, which is cool because like all the systems and processes are in place. And it's, I'm sure, it's a, it was a really good learning experience too, right? Like knowing exactly what made this company successful, right? And then learning all that. It's basically getting insider knowledge of like how this company operates. Now you can basically apply that. Okay, this works, this works, this doesn't work, or we can improve on this and apply that to basically any type of business that you kind of put together, right? Yeah, correct. That's exactly it. And and when you take that, you just mentioned like apply what works, what doesn't work. Again, you want to take in how it relates to real estate in the franchise world. And, and, we're, and that was in the fitness business, owning gyms, 24-hour gyms. It's market specific, right? When now being in it for so long, if I'm looking to open another franchise, another, you know, anytime fitness franchise, for me, it's market. Like I want to look at the market. I want to understand the market and then market specific. What works in that market for operating at any time may not work in Texas or may not work in like Philadelphia. I'm in the suburbs of Philly and what's going to work down in the city will not work up in our market, just like real estate. You got to understand those markets. It's just because it is, let's say turnkey or when you buy a franchise, like you buy Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's, well, you got to know that market, what's going to work and what may not work. And then you adjust from there. And that's what's nice about franchise work we invest and own in is there is that flexibility because there are some out there. It doesn't matter. You have to do it a certain way, but there is flexibility there. And that kind of translates the same with real estate. Yeah. I love that. And one thing that it's also, I mean, we, we also say, you know, understanding the market, understanding the market, like whether it's franchises that you're buying companies, things like that, providing some kind of service, but also like in real estate, right? You have to understand the market. But also, I guess what one thing when you're mentioning that just now is like one thing I didn't never really thought about. It's like actually understanding the culture of that market, right? Which is part of the market, but like a cultural thing is very human, right? And like, it's, you know, these things that we developed in our little niche communities, right? Like, for example, let's say you're, hey, you know, this is a highly populated area of like vegetarians, right? You're not going to put a McDonald's right in the middle of it, right? So it's like, you know, just thinking of it that way, like understanding the culture is part of understanding the market. But I feel like that is lost sometimes when you just say market broadly and understand, you know, like, well, I mean, it's all about too, like the trends of where the real estate is, right? Like we look for yeah. Starbucks, some people look for Walmart, some people, yeah. you know, like, is there a pawn shop within walking distance? If there is, it's usually something we don't look at. Like it all, yeah. it all goes together. Like if you put culture, just store specific. Right. Yeah. And well. I guess it depends on yeah. what your strategy is for real yeah, estate too, totally. right? Like if you're looking for B class or A class stuff, right? You wouldn't want to be around necessarily that pawn shop, right? You want to be looking for those Starbucks. Whereas, you know, Starbucks has already done the, the market research and say, Hey, here's a Starbucks. Yeah. It's going to go right here. So you know that area is good, right? And like for potentially B and A class, right? And so it's also very specific to the asset class you're investing in, right? So mobile home parks sure. versus A class apartments, right? So it's like very specific. True. But. Yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And the same, you know, like you guys just mentioned, all for the real estate in the different types of asset. That's what you're going to look for. And same from a business standpoint. And I don't even think I would even say just franchises. It'd be anybody's business, but yeah. knowing the culture and that neighborhood, what's going to work, I would suggest to anyone 
looking at you know, starting a business or a franchise, whether it's real estate franchising, is to understand where you want to put that. Okay, what's the neighborhood? What's the culture like? What are people looking for? Because if you can tailor your business towards that, and you're going to attract more customers, just like on real estate, right? We, we are, or I look at our investor base. So what's my investor base? Just like you know, when we we talk with you guys. You know, what is your investor base looking for? It's a certain asset class. They want to be a certain in a certain area. That's you're going to attract more investors, right? If that's like your investor base, well, then you want to start buying assets in that neighborhood or those areas, markets, because then your investors like that's I like that. I, you know, like mm-hmm. you guys mentioned, there's a Starbucks there, so I know that's how, you know Starbucks did the research, so I'm going to invest in that deal. Right. Um, so it's great, great point. Yeah, and it, and it goes and just elaborate more on that. I'll piggyback on that. It's like. It goes with understanding your investors and their risk profile too, right? Because like obviously, you know, more if you move higher in the classes, it's less risk, lower risk, but it's lower cash flow, right? But then you yeah. move down, you know, in the C class, it's you know a little bit higher cash flow and maybe taking a little bit more risk. But yeah, it's just understanding your investors, which I like yeah. that too. Understanding their yeah. culture too is very important and it translates over to that as well. I so. think it also can translate though to the sponsorship team as well, mm. right? With like sure. The systems and processes that we were talking about earlier, the culture, all of it, it's actually all intertwined, which is now a lot more fun because like, who is your sponsor, sponsor, right? Like, and their culture and what they believe in and like, who, who are they actually, as opposed to who they are on social media? It's all, Mm -hmm. it all really relates to everything. A hundred percent, a hundred percent great. Cause right. Like someone on social, you just mentioned social media. Yeah. That's somebody's highlight reel. That's yeah. not like they're you, who they could be every day person. And you guys said you make sure the sponsors align with the investors, right? Their values. I even think when, when you have like co-GPs on deals or JV deals, I've done them. I know you guys have done them. I always want to make sure do our values align just, just among the team, because yeah. if not, that could be a big, you know, headache down the road potentially and friction point if you the the GP group doesn't even agree agree on stuff. But I also think there should be alignment with those investors. And I think most of the investors out there, right? They when they're starting to vet sponsors or look at deals, it's it, it's a relationship game. And they want to make sure that the values of the sponsor align when they're going to invest. Or at least for me, that's something I look for when I'm investing as well. Is I want to make sure that I trust this sponsor and their values align with mine. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And I mean, whether or not you're a, a general partner forming a team to take down a deal or an investor investing in a, in a specific deal, like understanding that is, is very, very, very important. I just want to highlight that. It's like, yeah. and having multiple calls is, you know, Having multiple calls, having a, a set number of questions or, you know, you know, specific questions that you ask them to unturn certain rocks and things like that is very important because like a deal is not just the three months it takes to close on a deal, right? It is the yeah. money is made in the, the three to five years that you're holding that deal. And that's a, that's a marriage, right? It's like, yeah. it's a long time. Hopefully a marriage is longer. Yeah. Than, yeah. Like, you know, yeah. for, I was like, yeah. well, yeah. wait a minute. Work? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, yeah, it's a long-term dating process. Yeah. Right? It's like, and so, I mean, there's a lot of, but even, even us, like, when we first started, like, you know, we know exactly what we're looking for now in partnerships and, and, and what kind of, Partner, limited partners we're also looking for too, right? Yeah. And we've been able to communicate that in the, over the last several years. Yeah, it's just hard, right? Because like even as a first time investor or general partner or whatever, like you think you've asked all the questions and like you never really have. So even yeah. with that, right? Like if you're like, oh my gosh, I tried this once and it was horrific. I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know what to do. Like give yourself some grace because none of us did. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you guys said a great thing uh, uh, about explaining to the in potential investor or potential partners, you know, being up, being up front with them, because I think being truthful and honest and kind of what you mentioned, qualifying your investor there is you want to make sure that what their investment goals align as Michael, you just said, right. It could be a five, seven year potential period that you're holding someone's money. And one of the first deals I ever invested as an LP, or I should say, I didn't invest in this deal, but I was very fortunate that the operator talking to them, you know, doing your due, my due diligence and vetting them, they were really upfront because at the time I was just getting into it and I was trying to learn more and like, Hey, I'm going to be an LP first, put a lot of my money in there. And I was even going to use a part of a HELOC on it. And they were like, listen, just so you know, like the money's not liquid because I'm thinking similar to stock market stuff. Like, once it's in there, and if you're using a HELOC, you know, that it's not like I can, you're going to take and you're going to get enough money back to pay that off. And if you have variable interest rates, 
you got to hold that. And is the returns, um, the returns I'm telling you that you're going to get on this deal may not make it, it's not going to be worth it. If you use a HELOC with a five at the time, you know, four or 5% interest rate, or maybe even more, I can't remember. And I really appreciate that. Like they, they could have been like, yeah, this is great. Put your hundred thousand dollars in this deal. And I would not have known. I would have been like thinking, good, I'm investing. And they could have taken that, but he was straightforward with me and said, I don't think this would be the opportunity to do that. Why don't you wait for the next one? And you know, the next time it came around with that op- with that operator, I invested because I was I was ready at that time and I really appreciated them being upfront. And those are the values that aligned and I've invested in in their deal, their next one. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a very important. I mean, that's awesome that you had a conversation like that. Yeah. I think it's very important too. It's like, yeah, I mean, brutal honesty like that is really, sure. a lot of people are just raising money, right? They're like, yes, oh, I don't care how you get it to me. I need it. Right. So it's like, yeah. and then like, I think we're, you know, we're always making sure that we're not taking some pe- people's last. I was like, oh, I saved up, you know, 20,000, $25,000 or 50,000. This is my only $50,000 to invest. I'm like, mm, maybe we should wait, you know, like, but with and- that too, like, we're also not, I mean, everybody says they're underwriting conservatively, right? But like everyone knows we love Tulsa and like all of our, you know, like there's a lot of things we also put in place, right? Like fixed rate debt or rate caps, right? Did I say cap rates? (laughs) Rate caps. caps. Okay. (laughs) But like, or cash flowing from day one, you know, it all goes together to also ensure that those conversations. Yeah. I think it's great what you just said, right. About, uh, about there having those conversations, some of those hard conversations with investors, like, Hey, I, like you mentioned, I saved 50 grand. Well, listen, if that's your whole safety net being upfront and saying, I don't think you should use it all to me, that goes a long way with an investor. Like that's the company, that's the type of operator that I like to align myself with and be is who are going to have those conversations with somebody who wants to invest, but maybe it's really, you're telling them it's not the uh, the best opportunity. And then also qualifying. You said about, you know, let's qualify them is what's their goals. And for us, that's one of our biggest things is when I'm talking with potential investors or for me, other business owners in the franchise space to, to invest in real estate. State. I love to talk to those those owners and say you got to plan for the future. But those business owners who want to expand, or those those owners, franchise owners who are like, well, right now our business is just kind of struggling or just getting off the ground. I don't want to take. I'm like, listen, it's not now's not the time, right, to to invest. But down the road can be versus me trying to talk someone into, oh, you should put your money o- over here when it's really not the best opportunity right now. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think another good thing is like when you're talking to potential you know operators that you want to invest your money. And as an LP, or if you're looking to co GP with some of these sponsors, but like, hey, tell me about like some mishaps or some things that went wrong and how did you handle it? What was your communication yeah. style to the investors while that was happening too, right? So that everybody, if they've been in long enough, it's going to have a lot of, there's going to be issues, right? Yeah. Like not yeah. a lot of issues, but there's going to be issues, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's not if, but when those issues happen, right? And it's like, how do they handle it? How do they communicate it? And, you know, how do they, what did they learn from it and how they overcame it, right? So I think that's very important. I agree. I agree. I think all this is great when you're vetting either a sponsor, but also having this, those hard conversations, whether they're potential partners, LPs, GPs, this is all stuff that I think should go into someone's decision-making process. Yeah. yeah. And even for like the new bees out there, right? Cause like now I'm imagining Michael and myself and people have to have us that at the very beginning, you know, when we hadn't had a deal yet. So it's like, okay, well, this is really hard, but someone yeah. on your team needs to have had that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Because, well, I mean, one for the loan, but two, <laughs> like just in general, um, to be able to talk about it so that, you know, your investors do know, like having four fresh new people. And then just like a KP who has net worth and liquidity, but who's also never been in real estate, like that seems really hard to me just, and that's just my opinion, you know, but like that feels very risky to me. Like, oh, well, you know, because this person has high net worth and liquidity and we're signing, we're letting them sign on the loan. Like they don't have any other duties. Yeah. It's just like, okay, well now we're just hoping for the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, You're right. Right. You're just kind of hoping for the best. If someone you c- could counter and say, well, Hey, someone has to, they, they got to get their experience somewhere. But I think Susie, you, you, you hit the nail on the head there when you said you need to partner with someone who had that experience, but also maybe had that failure and you know for you guys for us 
that that's what we wanted to do is like, who I, I'm not there yet. Hey, I'm not going to be oh, buying a thousand units and come invest with us. No, no, no. I'm going to make sure that there's people on the team that have that experience or had those failures that we can rely on and have the track record. Those are the partners who we want to partner with. And that's how I'm going to get my experience and my team as partner, how we're going to get our experience is learning from them and working side by side so that eventually you know, who knows a year or two from now when that opportunity comes up for us to be that main partner or the the main GP, we now have all that experience. And we went through and handled some of those scenarios that you're talking about. Yeah. I just had a question about franchise. (laughs) Maybe this is coming full circle as well. (laughs) Do franchise uh, like the parent company, when they're, do they underwrite you when you're purchasing? Do they do their due diligence? They say like, hey, do they something similar? Like, hey, you saved up your life savings to invest in a franchise. Like, yeah. So you, like, how do they, how does the whole vetting process work to become a Sure. I, I can't speak to like every franchise system mm-hmm. out there and requirements I can speak to with Anytime Fitness. SE Brands is the parent company. And again, I don't want to like take us way down this franchise business rabbit hole, but they do. There will, there's going to be some liquidity and net worth requirements. There are also going to be from, we talked earlier about location, right? They're going to look at locations and pull all the demographics and statistics to make sure they want you to be successful, right? They, they, they want, it's in their best interest to have a franchise unit open and be successful, not open and close. They shouldn't be just going out there and, Hey, here, buy 10, buy 15, knowing that you can't afford it or you'll never be successful because they're just going to close. There is that support on the back end, but there's also to making sure you can't afford it, right? They're gonna they're gonna want to make sure that you have the capacity and the funds to then sustain it for a little bit. You know, there's financing options that go into there, and and I assume a lot of other franchise systems are probably the same way. And you could Google. I know people Google like McDonald's or even like Planet Fitnesses, and it'll tell you like you need to have this kind of net worth and this type of liquidity to be able to purchase a franchise because as much as franchises are the turnkey, as I said, like buy and you get it, you're just buying the license. You still got to finance like whatever type of franchise, whether it's build out, whether it's equipment, operating and like that's, they don't get, you're not buying that as well. Like they're, you're just buying a license to have that name brand and all the software and all the back end support. You still got to build out like whatever bid, like a Dunkin' Donuts, you got to build the Dunkin' Donuts and you got to like the working capital and all the equipment. That's not part of that. So again, that's why it's important to to make sure they're vetted because those companies want to see their franchisees succeed. Yeah. Cool. I was- to draw that parallel, right? Same, yeah. right? same. We want to see our LPs succeed. Yeah. Succeed. Same thing with franchise. Yeah, big time. And we gotta figure out how to get a Chick Fil A franchise. So that every time I drive by one, <laughs> it's never nonstop traffic from the day it, or the minute it opens to the time. Yep. It constant. Yeah, constant. constant. There are always there's lines. Oh, anytime yeah. you drive by one, lines. Yeah. yeah, multiple lanes, like twelve lane drive. Yeah. Really, anyways, so there you go. Fun. Open no, a couple out in Tulsa. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Me I mean, too. the only thing I was going to even just to end this with, I guess, and t- before we go into our adventures for is like how important systems and processes are, no matter what the business type, you know, like that being able to have that kind of organization, one will like help you shoot off in- with some success, but like even in your personal life, like anything, right? Like just having that organization and like having one place where everything is and like some place for people to track, right? Like Michael and I have KPIs, we use Asana, like all of these yeah. systems and processes do wonders. So they're not, and they're not that difficult to learn. Actually, it's very self-taught if you just take the time and sit. So if you're like, oh no, I don't know how to do this. Like I promise you do. And it's required everywhere in life. And it's something that I think everyone should learn. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Yeah, I, I agree 100% what you just said there. Systems in place, whether it's your life, your business, real estate, your job, it can help you be very successful, keep you on track and keep you organized there. So I, I agree with that. Love it. Well, so thank you so much, Todd, for your time. So thus of course. Far. We're now going to transition into yeah. the Adventurous Four questions, if you're ready. Let's go. Yeah, I've always enjoyed, enjoyed this part of your podcast. Your people <laughs> have to say where they want to go, what they want to do. <laughs> Don't spoil it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not there yet, Todd. That's funny. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> so the first question we have for you, Todd, is yeah. where is one place you wish to travel to? And in- yeah, probably, hopefully, in in coming up soon. But the one place we we want to go as a family is over to Greece. We have not been there, and just l- love the the history, and just heard how beautiful it is. As a family trip for my wife and our kids, we want to get to Greece here. Hopefully, in the next couple within the next two or three years. That's, that's kind of on our bucket list. Nice. Any specific islands? Not specific. You know, we our goal would be is probably a little bit of a longer trip. And over the summer, you know, when there's not in school where we can kind of not just go because we were in Italy and it was like a quick five, like week. We only had a week and I feel like there's so much more to do. So that's on our list to go back to. But we really want to do like a longer, you know, 10 day type of trip over to Greece and experience yeah. everything. Yeah. Love it. Got to do Santorini. Obligatory, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, would, yeah. I would suggest just spending all the time in the islands uh not so okay much. you want to do athens do athens for like a day or two and then pop to the islands immediately so just stay okay yeah, yeah. that's what I've, I've heard so okay so you you guys you guys are the ones i gotta hit up when we're starting to play <laughs> all the yeah. yeah i like it absolutely uh, <laughs> so our second question is what is one thing on your bucket list and how are you leveraging real estate investing to achieve it yeah i would this goes right into the, my first one there about where i would want to travel is for for me it's been it's been traveling and having all these experience like experiences for with my family that was kind of one of the things when i got into real estate is what we wanted to do and we are very outdoor adventurous a little bit would love to ski or bike we are outdoors a lot and we talked last time I was out at the time out in Breckenridge and Vale skiing and real estate investing passively but also actively has provided that been able to provide that lifestyle where we have the freedom to travel I've been able to travel within the states outside the states a little bit and having to be being able to take my kids and experience other cultures and just the history even within within the country here we've been you know just recently from Annapolis and you know the historical sites around it's just really Really cool that we can give our kids that and and that's that's real estate's been able to to provide that investing in real estate yeah and it love helps that. like grow and shape them so i love that too yeah yes absolutely so the third question we have for you is what is one piece of advice for someone who wants to start passively investing in real estate I would say, you know, and prior to our conversation here today, right, I was thinking about this and, and kind of what we talked about was was going to be part of my answer. And I think it's really making sure if you're passively investing, you want to be an LP or just passively is make sure your values are aligned with the sponsor. And that's kind of what we talked about earlier in our conversation is you want to vet your sponsor a little bit, but make sure your goal aligns with whatever you're investing in. If Again, if you need your money short term, well, you don't want to invest in something that's going to be a long-term buy and hold there. And if an operator's up front with you, I think that's what you want to look for as a passive investor. And once you find that, then that's a great time to invest at that point. Oh, thank you Love for it. that. Yeah, yeah, me too. And then our fourth and final question is, if you had unlimited resources available to you, how would you leave an impact? Yeah, this is a great question. I love that you guys asked this because I think it's very important to give back socially, whether it, you know, what, whatever it might be out there, try to make that impact. One of the things that I'm passionate about, just because I have kids and we talk about it a lot, but I think if I had unlimited resources, it, it would be like, just education for kids, uh, you know, start in our country across the, across the world there, but more specifically love to do like financial education. I just feel like just for me as a, as a kid, I mean, my parents did a great job, give them all the credit in the world, but coming out just like the financial literacy out there had no idea really like there's other things from owning your own business, but how to invest money. And, you know, I could, balance a checkbook, which is great and have a savings account, but there's so much more to learn out there. And I think if kids have that foundation, whether it's through schooling and in the schools, but I think that would go a long way to setting them up for success later in life. And and that would be something I would love to do. No, I do too. And I completely agree because we don't even use checkbooks anymore. So like I'm not hundred percent sure what's being taught, but that's totally okay. (laughs) Fun fact about Oklahoma. Oklahoma was one of the first states that required a financial literacy class to be taken taken as a senior in high school. Yay. I love it. I think that's, I think that's great because I've run into, you know, people, I won't give names in there that it's like, you, you don't even know like the basics on like, you have to pay back a credit card. Like they didn't even know got a credit card, didn't know you have to pay it back. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, let's make sure that never happens where you rack up credit card debt. You didn't realize you had to pay it back. Yeah. So speaking of that, sorry, I know you want to end this, but like I was reading, I get like Robin Hood snacks, whatever. I don't know if you read yeah. those every week, but anyways, one of the things I was talking about today is like how Amex has set, set aside $2.1 billion in because they, they believe that's how much bad debt they have right now. Wow. Oh I did not see so that. Very. Yeah. 
Yeah, because now all the all that. the reserves, you know, everybody's sure. all, all, everybody's COVID funds or savings has now been wiped clean. And now we're going. People have they keep spending like they have the yep. reserves and that they don't have it anymore. So two uh, we'll billion dollars, six six to nine months. Yeah, and that's, I mean, just, that's, that's just, just Amex. That's just Amex, right? Imagine, I mean, majority of the people, consumers out there don't have an Amex, no. right? Because I think it's yeah. an echelon like credit card, right? And imagine, you know, what City or, you know, Chase or something like yeah. that, how much they're setting aside. And I think there's numbers in there, but I don't remember off the top of my head. So yeah, we wow. see nine months. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's let's hope there's not major default like that, because that that would spread way through the economy, which is already suffering in different right. ways. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's all yeah. we need. Your fun fact was better than mine, so that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, before we end the show, would you mind sharing with our adventurous family how they can get, reach out to you and learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm online. I'm on Instagram. You can follow me on, find me on Instagram there or the best way and LinkedIn, I should say, is I post a lot on the on LinkedIn channel or through our website at summitcap.co. You can shoot me an email. If anyone wants to talk franchises, have questions on franchises, feel free. I would love to help anyone out if you're interested in buying one, you know, walk you through the pros and cons as well. So love talking to all types of investors. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate that. Yeah. And Always. then I will add all of those links so that yeah. you can easily find Todd and please do reach out, right? Like Todd and, you know, people like Michael and I just love talking about real estate all day long. So please, please, please reach out. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. So until next time, explore more adventure awaits. Woo!